The overall appearance of many non-domestic buildings is determined by the transparency and form of the building envelope. This lecture seeks to highlight some of the conflicts that emerge when trying to realise the design intent and manage client expectations, while simultaneously meeting the many technical challenges of doing so. I'm a bit of a glass anorak, so this is not essential, but if you end up at a company who does specialise in glass, this is the sort of thing, unfortunately, that they, on the client side, that they're quite interested in. So they will expect you to be able to do all the technical stuff, the G values, the U values, transmission rates, and all the rest of it. But they will also expect you to have a, some idea about what the effect of your decisions is on what the glass looks like. Some of the key things, I suppose, would be to understand what the design intent is. In other words, what did the client really want? What were they really expecting? And their expectations are generally managed by either uh, renders and images or physical models. And you will have to spend a lot of your time, again, if you go into the glass side of the industry, managing their expectations because what they want and what they can actually get for the budget they've got isn't always accessible. Also, you've got to be aware of the implications of making subtle changes. So although in, the, in past lectures we talked about the effects of G-values and the impact of things like lowly coatings, what we haven't talked about is how that affects the, the look of the glass. Generally, overall, the completed facade tends to be slightly more transparent than the initial concept, depending on whether you've got blowy or reflective coatings on it. So all the sort of things that affect that, and there's a lot of them, the quality and level of light. So obviously it changes from day to night a lot. The area makes a difference. So if you're looking at acres of glass, it makes a difference between that and looking at a small area of glass. The viewing angle we've talked about already, how as you offset the viewing angle, the reflectance changes and gets more and more and more. And of course, the distance will be affected by the reflectivity of the glass. I'll talk about different types of transparency and form. So as we go from more transparent to less transparent, then the form becomes much more important. Transparent buildings or highly transparent buildings tend not to have a, as distinct a form, whereas less transparent buildings have a much more solid appearing form. Again, we'll look at views in and out because no one really thinks about what it's like on the inside. I'll talk briefly about fritted glass. I've mentioned it before, but I'll look at some examples of fritted glass instead of more tints and shadings and so on. I'll finish off with a slightly obscure thing. We don't really think about this much, but there is a bit of a problem with polarised light and reflection from buildings and bird kills. Stay with me on that one. Of course, for specialist glasses, last uh, couple of weeks ago, we talked about how do you change or how do you improve glass on particularly listed buildings which have vintage glass or specialist glazing units. How do we replace those? And I'll finish off with media facades. And if we've got time, I'll just talk about, about some glass research. So in terms of the levels of daylight, from the inside, from the user, it does give shape to the building. So with sufficient light, it can help you guide you and take you around a building, but also the objects within the building, if especially if you're in a museum, it does give them shape and form. And whatever type of light you do use, uh, or daylight you do use, will determine what level of contrast and, and form you get. When it comes to quality of internal light, we've been talking about levels, in other words, making sure we meet minimum levels and we've got a maximum level which minimizes glare but you don't necessarily to have vast quantities of daylight to have a good quality of light because it does depend on the building so if we look at say this sort of building where it's supposed to be a much quieter more somber environment so actually you can achieve a good quality of light with very very small openings and the first thing you notice here is the intensity or the reveals I mean they're huge so what they're trying to do is make the most of the tiny little windows they have. So it gives them privacy. It gives them a very somber, quiet atmosphere. With small windows and such thick walls, you've got good acoustic attenuation as well, so it's quiet. So you don't necessarily need masses and masses of glass to achieve good gauge lighting levels. It does depend quite severely on the type of building you're illuminating. The glazed area, again, if you want to achieve the appearance of a large glass box, or in this case, a large glass blob, you don't actually need the whole facade to be fully glazed. So this is the City Hall in London. The building here has between 60 and 70% glazing. The glazed areas are these strips of glass here. And then they have individual insulated spandrel panels with a glazed front. So they're glazed spandrel panels. So from a distance, it looks like a glass blob but actually it's not all fully glazed. And if we compare that with the building next to it, which is almost 98% glazed, the City Hall 
will probably have much better control of its daylighting and its overheating and glare because it's only got 50, 60, 70% glazing to deal with. Over here, with 98% glazing, they've got people with blinds up and down, the lights are on or off all the time. It limits internal flexibility. You may not necessarily be able to put your desk right up against the window because of glare and daylighting issues. So it's not necessarily urgent to have 100% glazed area to give you that appearance of a glass box. The viewing angle is quite important, as we've said. As you become more off angle, then the glass appears less and less clear. So if we're looking from the outside in, for instance, at the Louvre, I mean, they have low iron glass, but because of the age of the building, if you look at the amount of structural material they have, if they built the same building now, or the same pyramid now, you could probably get away with 50, 60% less frame and bigger pieces of glass. But when you're looking from the inside out, you can see how clear it is. It is very, very low iron glass. The idea of having a pyramid at the Louvre was controversial at the time anyway. One of the biggest concerns was vandalism. They felt that um, with a glass box in the middle of Paris, people would just, you know, vandalise the glass. So just in case, they actually kept the equivalent of two pyramids worth of glass. That's a lot of extra glass. So they got enough glass to make two more pyramids just in case any of the panes got damaged. To me, that's overkill. Normally, you'd only require maybe one, two, five percent tops in terms of spares. But in 30 years, they've not needed any of them. So there's a little, there's a storage depot somewhere in Paris, which has enough glass to build the pyramid twice. And moving on to viewing angle, it's not absolutely clear exactly why the viewing angle is important in this building. But when you move down the side of the facade, I mean, you can see that this is just a normal plain glass facade. But down the side, there's something odd going on here. What they've done is they've added glass fins to the side of the building. And the original intention was to actually articulate the shape and side of the building with the glass fins. I'm not sure you can make it out, but you notice there's a slight wave and a curve that's actually articulated by the shape of the fins. So each fin itself is just slightly different in shape and profile from the next one. And it gives the impression of a waving facade. Unfortunately, the original client was an IT company and they decided to move out and then they ran out of money. And the idea was to actually illuminate the ends of those fins. viewing angle this building appears to be almost 100% glass from one angle if you move 90 degrees you'll find actually that that particular facade facing 90 degrees from the glazed angle is completely solid so it has a clear side and a kind of solid side that's not necessarily to do with articulating the form of the building it's more to do with maximizing daylight from this orientation but minimising glare from this orientation. What about distance? I'll be talking about mirrored glass later on as well and some other impacts of mirrored glass. But if you have a highly mirrored or highly reflective facade, then the distance is incredibly important. The eye is incredibly good at picking out small faults in glass, or rather not so much the glass, the joints between the glass. So you have to make sure that A, the glass is incredibly flat. If you have a curve, as you have on this top left hand picture, it, having completely flat glass over that gentle curve will give you the reflection that you're after. Even if one or two of the panes is slightly off and not quite flat, your eye tends to pick it up. And the further away you go, the more exaggerated the effect becomes. So for instance, the top bottom left hand one, but the first thing you might notice is the fact that all the joints between the glass aren't quite consistent and the way it's lined up isn't quite consistent, and that breaks up the reflective image. Moving to the right, I mean, obviously this middle one clearly was never designed to be spectrally flat. It was deliberately designed to be unflat and wavy. They wanted that effect of rippling water and so on. And the one on the bottom right, again, they deliberately wanted to give the effect of not flat glass. And they're trying to mimic, I think, a, a sort of mirrored log store. So you can play about with 
the facade and the reflectance of it. But if your intention is to have a perfect reflection like the top right, every single pane has to be incredibly flat and the junction between them has to be pretty well perfect. What about the level, the amount of transparency? Back in the old days, when we used to make models of buildings, we'd make them out of perspex. And perspex was never that good at being clear. Here they've used white perspex because they wanted something which had a slight frosting on it. But in the end, they couldn't afford the glass. And then end up being sort of normal clear glass. So the design intent, I mean, if you showed the client that, and they ended up with that, they probably wouldn't be that disappointed. Whereas if the model looked like this, and the end result looked like that, they might be. You don't know what their intention is. Very often you find a bit of post rationalization of the final design. If the client loves it, then you'll say, yes, that's, that's what I intended to happen. If they don't like the look of it, then you have to start managing their expectations. But at that point, it's normally too late because they've already paid for the building. In general, buildings aren't supposed to be completely transparent. It's very hard to get a complete transparent building. Take an early example. This is the first version of Apple's Fifth Avenue store. Because of the technology at the time, they were restricted to relatively small bits of glass. You notice that each piece is just under three meters. Okay, so remember what we said about the size of glass. They wanted longer pieces in order to connect them all together. You've got lots of different metal connections and it isn't quite what they were after. Whilst it is a glass box, it isn't that transparent. And you notice the color as well. There's a slight greenness to it. So it's definitely not low iron glass. And again, from various different angles, you can see actually, rather than seeing a transparent box, all you're seeing is the color of the glass and all the little tiny connection details. And what happens if you tint the same glass box? Here, we've added a very slight tint to it. And all of a sudden, the whole box becomes more of a cube. You can actually see the shape and form. Here you can see the form, but the form is slightly disturbed by the fact you've got all these little connections in the detail. But as soon as you add a tint, then the form becomes much more precise. So here, if the designer wanted to achieve a light glass box that looks like a box, then he's probably achieved the desired effect. And also because it's in Madrid, having the light tint is appropriate for the area because it doesn't look as though he's got any openings. So it doesn't look like it's gonna be ventilated very well. So he's gonna need quite a heavy tint to make sure the building doesn't overheat too much. Others have actually used the differences in transparency. So they've got an opaque facade at the back for the piano and a highly transparent, but very reflective glass for the violin. So the focal point is actually the bit that you don't normally see. Normally you don't look at glass boxes in the same way, but it, they've actually used it to shape and articulate the entrance to this music centre. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture and it has opened your eyes to resolving some of the complexities of successfully delivering highly glazed building envelopes. And we look forward to seeing you on the course in future.